As an island race, we have had a long, close relationship with the sea. It has been a source of food and fuel. It has provided work and pleasure. It has been our protector in time of war. The sea can be a friend and a provider, but it can also be our enemy. All who put out to sea in boats of any description do so at their peril if they do not respect the ways of the ocean. For centuries we have been a seafaring nation and the sea has claimed countless numbers of our countrymen. The idea of an organised body devoted to saving lives at sea came to one William Hillary as he watched a fishing fleet being destroyed by a storm off the coast of the Isle of Man. Through his determination, a nationally coordinated lifeboat service was formed in 1824 and in 1854 this service became the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. Probably the most famous sea rescue in British maritime history happened 14 years after the forming of the lifeboat service. On the morning of the 7th of September 1838, the steamship Forfarshire foundered on one of the Farne Islands off the Northumberland coast. The wreck was spotted from the Longstone Lighthouse by the keeper and his daughter, 22 years old, Grace Darling. In an heroic effort to rescue survivors, Grace and her father set out in their 21-foot cobble. Despite the punishing conditions, their valiant efforts resulted in the rescue of nine survivors. Grace Darling became the heroine of her time. The story of this rescue was a great boost to the aspirations of the founders of the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. To this day, the name of Grace Darling is closely associated with the RNLI. A memorial to Grace can be seen in the churchyard opposite to the cottage in which she was born in Bamborough, Northumberland. It was the reenactment of another rescue which was to be a major contribution to the RNLI's 175th anniversary celebrations in 1999. Early Sunday morning and a bank holiday crowd lined the streets of Whitby where a 100 year old lifeboat, recently renovated, was being hauled along to the official start of a remarkable journey. Six miles south at Robin Hood's Bay at the top of the steep main street, there is a plaque set into the wall which describes the incredible rescue of six survivors of the Whitby Brigantine, the Visitor. Amazingly, the Whitby lifeboat was brought overland to be launched at Robin Hood's Bay and directing this dramatic rescue was the coxswain, Henry Freeman. Astonishingly, Henry had been the sole survivor of a lifeboat disaster in 1861 when the Whitby boat was overwhelmed in a severe February storm. The Overland lifeboat tow was to be re-enacted and for this the lifeboat was mounted upon the original carriage used at the time of the actual rescue in 1881. The well-publicised event had brought a large crowd of onlookers to the quayside starting point, including a film crew who would record the event. A team of four shire horses would start the tow, aided by around 150 volunteers throughout the day. Former Whitby lifeboat coxswain Pete Thompson played the part of Henry Freeman. The lifeboat tow was organised by Ian Hudson, who is a fundraiser for the RNLI in and around Robin Hood's Bay. Ian had read the enthralling story of the 1881 rescue 
and believed it exemplified the courage and determination of the lifeboat lads of that time. It was a print of Henry Freeman which would bring together Ian Hudson and another RNLI fundraiser, Shirley Harris, Lifeboat Guild member of Yeadon, near Leeds. I went along to Whitby in October 1998 and I won a prize which was the picture of Henry Freeman and I didn't realise the significance of the picture until next morning when I saw the picture in the local Whitby Gazette. The, the man that was organising the event, uh, the reenactment, was called Ian Hudson and he rang me and asked me if I'd let him have the picture, which is what I've done. Uh -huh. I want to donate the money that the picture makes to Eden are in the line. Naturally, Shirley had travelled over to Whitby to be at the reenactment, and she joined the hundreds of onlookers who lined the route. The main thing was seeing the lifeboat come up the hill, um, to see the man that organised it running along the front and men from Drax Power Station pulling the lifeboat. While spectators waited patiently, they would do well to remember the appalling weather conditions that prevailed at the time of the original rescue, a far cry from this summer day in 1999. The horses will be unhitched here and a heavy wrecker unit attached to the back of the carriage in order to, uh, in order to steady the carriage and the pullers as they descend into Robin Hood's Bay. Hopefully, we are going to launch the boat at Robin Hood's Bay, but that decision will not be made until we get there. Uh, conditions prevailing at the time will dictate whether we launch or we don't. Thank you for the moment. On the morning of January the 18th, 1881, off the coast at Robin Hood's Bay, a ship's rowing boat was seen secured to the mast of the sunken brig The Visitor. On board were six survivors. On seeing their plight, and because the Robin Hood's Bay lifeboat was unseaworthy, an SOS was sent out to Whitby for assistance. But at Whitby, the weather was too bad to launch the lifeboat, so the coxswain, Henry Freeman, decided to have the boat towed to Robin Hood's Bay. It took 200 men and 18 horses to tow the lifeboat across the countryside through eight foot deep snowdrifts in blizzard conditions. They finally reached their goal, successfully launched and rescued the marooned survivors.
The reenactment was very much a symbolic event, but was nevertheless a feat of endurance for the people towing the lifeboat. The most challenging part of the tow was the final descent down the narrow, twisting main street. When we see the problems encountered by this modern day team, one can only imagine the difficulties Henry Freeman and his men must have faced. Driven by the need to save the lives of those six survivors, the determined team came through and have become part of local folklore. The tiny village was overwhelmed by visitors keen to see the final part of the lifeboat tow. It was evening before the lifeboat reached the sea where a service of dedication was conducted. The lifeboat was launched and rowed back to Whitby on the next morning tide. The reenactment had been a success and had raised thousands of pounds in donations for the lifeboat service. The small fishing villages along the coast are home to the local inshore fishermen who still earn a modest living from the sea. They know only too well the dangers faced whilst at the mercy of the sea and are grateful for the existence of the lifeboat service. At Filey, the modern lifeboat station contains two rescue vessels. The small inflatable D-class boat is used mainly for rescuing pleasure craft and holiday makers in trouble near to the shore. With a 40 horsepower outboard engine, it has a top speed of 20 knots. The Mersey class lifeboat is an all weather self writing vessel and has been on station at Filey since 1991. 
This boat is well equipped and comfortable compared to previous types. But the crews of these lifeboats still take great risks to help people in trouble. I wondered who these volunteers were, so I spoke to Barry Robson, Filey Lifeboat's second coxswain and mechanic. I asked him where volunteer crew members came from. From all varied, you know, walks of life. Of people who join who have never actually been to sea before. Really? You yeah. know, work on the land, you know, work in, in shore jobs and never actually go to sea. We have one, at the moment we have one lady crew member works in an office of the town. Really? But she was like, she was a member of the Sea Cadets, uh -huh. you know, years ago. And then she, you know, she joined through that, I think. But we have actually, you don't have to be born to go to sea. Not all the lads are fishermen. Right. You know, they all have you know, full-time jobs in the town. School okay. teacher, policemen, right. plumbers. Really? You know. The, the coxswain at the moment is a joiner by trade. Mm -hmm. You know he does his trade, but he's, he works. He actually been on the crew 30 years now, so nice. he's done his time. What do you get out of it then? What does it do? What do you for get it? out of it? Oh, a lot of you get a lot of satisfaction out of doing the job. You know you always feel like helping somebody. You know they always say when you take a child back to the beach, you know, and his mother and father come down and thank you. You know that's enough. But you know the jobs that you go, you don't. Sometimes you don't get thanks. You know, sometimes you tow a boat in, you they throw the rope off and say bye bye, and that's it. What's the most dramatic rescue that you've been on? We've actually spent 12 hours search for a plane for a tornado plane in uh, 1990. Well, this year, no, last year, 98 in June. But we've searched 16 hours for a boat and not found anything. You know, things like that. They're not yes. right, you know, local fishermen. Yes. And you, yes. you know, you sort of knew them. But, yeah. you know, they're, they're the most sort of traumatic old so. There's nothing you can do when you get there. You know fine well the boat's sunk, you're just, you know, hoping that they're still hopping about floating, alive. But it uh, always happen like that, I'm afraid. <laughs> you know, you've got to learn to take the good with the bad in this job. You know, you don't all see the glory, you know, riding about and s pulling people out alive. You know, you've got to think of the other end of the scale where you know you're going to be there. Yes. You know, and you, you've not got to forget that these lads are volunteers, you yeah. know, that they do it for the love of it. Yeah. You know, when you join the fire service and things like that, you expect to, you know, you know you're going to get called to nasties, you know, but these lads just do it for, yeah. for the love yeah. of it, really. Yes, yes, so. yes. Barry and his fellow crew members stand justifiably proud next to their boats. The Mersey-class boat is designed to be carriage launched and is towed out over Filey's Beach by a special semi-submersible tractor. A few miles up the coast at Scarborough, another Mersey-class boat is on the station. This boat was provided by a bequest of Mr Frank Stubbs of Bournemouth in memory of Mrs Fanny Victoria Wilkinson. It is powered by two Caterpillar turbocharged marine diesel engines and is fitted with sophisticated equipment for navigation and communication. The upper steering position duplicates the controls in the wheelhouse. An early morning launch to berth the boat in Scarborough Harbour was an opportunity to view the lifeboat in the open air and demonstrate the carriage launching technique for which this class of lifeboat was designed. This form of launching is undertaken at 22 lifeboat stations around the coast. The first of the Mersey class boats was placed on station at Bridlington in November 1988. Due to the inherent buoyancy of the watertight wheelhouse, the lifeboat can self right in five seconds should it ever capsize.
The hull is designed with a tunnel stern to give protection to the propellers. The Mersey has a speed of 17 knots, more than twice the speed of the Oakley class lifeboat which it replaced. One of the Yorkshire Coast's most well-known Oakley-class lifeboats was stationed at Flamborough Head. In 1992, not long before its controversial withdrawal, the Flamborough boat returns to station after an exercise. Lifeboat station was sighted high above the beach at Flamborough's North Landing, which in itself provided a natural sheltered location into which the boat could be launched in all weather conditions. It was also a spectacle to see the boat being winched back up to the lifeboat house at the summit of the steep slipway, and many holidaymakers enjoyed this event most Sunday afternoons. The Will and Fanny Kirby was one of many Oakley class boats operated by the RNLI from its introduction in 1963. 48 and a half feet long and weighing 27 tonnes, the Oakley class boats had a top speed of nine knots. Being an all-weather vessel with a long range, the Flamborough boat provided a major service in the seas around Flamborough, so it was no surprise that the decision to withdraw this class of boat in July 1992 and replace it with a smaller, semi-rigid inflatable boat was met by derision from the crew and local people alike. This was one of the last times the boat would return to this station. The change went ahead as planned and even included a move to the south side of the headland where a new lifeboat station was built. The new boat, complete with tractor and carriage, was installed.
Designated the Atlantic class, this lightweight inflatable boat is powered by two 70 horsepower engines, giving it a top speed of 34 knots, the fastest boat in the RNLI's fleet. To find out if this boat copes with the conditions around Flamborough, I spoke to the Honorary Secretary, Chris Hoskinson. It's a far more versatile craft, it's a lot, it's a lot faster. You know, it can be in and out, most jobs are only an hour, and uh, I say it, really it is far more versatile, it's, it's good for working around the cliffs. As you can see on a day like today, which, which isn't the best of days, the weather, it does have some limitations on it, obviously, but today we've got a so easily, I should think, 4-6 anyway, and it you know, handles it no problems at all, so it really is a versatile boat. As the boat returns from an exercise and attempts to dock onto its carriage on a grey September day, the steersman has to call on all his skills to safely dock onto the submerged carriage. Normally, in these conditions, a net would be rigged to catch the boat, but due to operational reasons, this was not used on this particular occasion. Eventually the boat was secured and all returned safely to shore. So the next time you see an RNLI fundraiser, think of the brave volunteer lifeboat crews out on the cold merciless sea and give generously. One day, it may be you who needs their help. <laughs>